very pleased to be able to speak today with Mr. M. Ramaswamy, the president of Singapore Exchange, and the back of some very interesting recent developments um, in the exchange's attempts to become more regional. Uh, Mr. Ramaswamy, thank you very much for having joined us to this morning. Um, well, you're coming on the back of some very interesting developments in terms of Singapore Exchange's desire to become more regional uh, in its attempt to um, um, be merged with the Australian Stock Exchange. Uh, where are we now really in terms of the conversations, in terms of the perceptions of uh, the Australian government in terms of what, how far they would want to support um, you know, such an initiative? Uh, morning, Emmanuel. Thanks for having me here. I think this morning the Honorable Treasurer in Australia came out with a formal statement that uh, he does not approve of this particular deal going forward. And along with that, he's kind of made a couple of other remarks, which is the rationale for kind of saying no to this and what they think would happen in the future in Australia. So having taken note of that, I think we will work towards, you know, seeing how that develops and where Australia goes over time. But for us, you know, it's uh, life goes on as usual. I think that this was a transaction that we were hoping to do. We thought there was uh, good potential and upside for both the exchanges. That's kind of why we pursued that. But not having that kind of immediately come to fruition is not by any means, a, you know, a, a disaster for us. It's something that we just live with and we'll move on. But the Singapore exchange over the past five to eight to ten years has been finding or looking for the Philip. Uh, in order uh -huh. to see what the next big thing is in, in, in the exchanges world. Um, and on a number of fronts, uh, you are challenged, just as many exchanges around the world are challenged. Um, you had for a time um, the, um, the prospects of the Chinese listings in, in uh -huh. Singapore. Um, and then you did a lot of uh, joint venture deals, especially with the Indian companies and Indian exchanges in terms of uh, representing their products uh, on your platform. Um, and then, more recently, um, you've had initiatives with um, ChiX and, uh -huh. um, you know, to, to, to look on the electronic platform. It would appear that nothing seems to be working too well. Okay. You know, uh, I, th I think what I need to do is kind of step back and talk about the strategy for the Singapore Exchange, what it's been doing over the past, let's say, five, seven years, as you point out and where it's trying to go and, and, and where we think we'll be in a few years from now. If you, if you take the exchange, there are three big activities. One is, uh, you know, the ability to raise capital for, for the industry and for, in, you know, companies that want to raise capital. The second is the securities marketplace where the trading of these takes place. And then the third is the derivatives marketplace where, you know, there's a lot of derivatives contracts that we trade. And in each of these contexts, we try to play the role of a gateway to Asia. And, and let me explain that in kind of each of the contexts. So in the first context, which is capital raising, what we look at as a gateway to India is we have companies from all around Asia who list on our exchange. In increasingly, companies don't look to list only on your home exchange in terms of raising capital. What's happening is there is a sectoral specialization that's coming across exchanges. If you look at uh, SGX, we kind of have a number of REITs or real estate companies that are from China, India, and, and around the region that are listed on SGX. Similarly, there's a concentration of marine and port-related activities, where you have companies all the way from Norway through to most of the Asian locations, which kind of list on SGX. So we, the third area we would like to focus on is uh, mining and minerals, where I think there's a lot of potential from you know, companies in Australia, companies in Indonesia, which need to raise a large amount of capital for them to kind of be able to pursue what they need to pursue. And lastly, the infrastructural trust. We kind of look at India and, and uh, Vietnam and places like that which require a lot of infrastructural investments. And again, we look at a listing venue for that. So in our context, what we look at is, given the fact that the Singapore marketplace itself is limited, what we are trying to do is become a regional hub for raising capital and be available for all these kind of four or five specialized industries to be a listing venue, right? So that's the first of our strategies. The second part of it, which is the trading venue. Now, as a trading venue, increasingly uh, around the world, when you look at it, there's more and more evidence that people do want 
execution capability which is institutionally driven. That's how the dark pools kind of emerged. And so what we do want to do is kind of not fight that trend but play with that, which is kind of provide better execution capability such that the retail investor has the things they need, the institutional investors have the things they need. And again, in both of these, if you look at a marketplace, the, the key is about being fair, transparent, and orderly. And, and, and that's kind of what we ensure. So, so, you know, the marketplace we run is therefore amenable to both an institutional trader and a retail trader. And then the last piece, which is the derivatives piece, again, we play very strongly to what we call a gateway to Asia because we have derivatives contracts that provide an underlying marketplace which is very different. So we have a contract from NIF India, which is a Nifty contract that we trade. We have the largest liquidity on the Nifty outside of India. It trades on CME and on us. So if you compare, we, we trade the Nikkei contract. We trade the Taiwanese contract. So over time, what we want to do is kind of be able to trade every contract that is in Asia to provide this ability to come to one place and be able to trade the derivatives of that marketplace. So in this context, a small trader sitting in, let's say, Chicago, who are all the futures traders on CME, by coming into one exchange in Asia can take a position or a view or a participate in the underlying economics of all of the Asian marketplaces. So that's kind of the third aim. And, and in, now what we are looking at is the emergence of the commodities marketplace. And I think that over the last several years, you know, depending on who you talk to, the production and the consumption of commodities is its largest in Asia, you know, with China and India being huge consumers and, and Indonesia and Australia being big producers. But at the same time, when you look at the commodities marketplace, most uh, you know, price discoveries happens in London, happens in you know, Texas, West Texas crude. So, so very little price discovery is happening in the places where commodity is produced and consumed but price discovery happens elsewhere and these contracts are traded off those prices. So I think over time, in the next five, seven years, Asia will develop its own price discovery mechanisms and we will be a key part of that. So, so, so in this backdrop, right, that's where you got to look at how we're trying to transact with anybody else. And, and, and as an exchange, we've been pioneering in many of the efforts. So if you take our association with CME, you know, it started in, I think, 1984 and, and uh, at that time, no one thought about working with exchanges cross-border. And even today, we have the only mutual offset agreement in place around the world between CME and SGX. And so a trader sitting in Asia can trade contracts that are fungible with those on the CME and kind of decide to clear it in another location. So it provides great you know, risk control as well as uh, clearing capabilities, but allows you access on a 24-hour basis to that contract, you know, either in CME or here. So, so if you take all of these efforts and kind of look at how SGX has grown over time, you know, it's uh, grown pretty well. We have a cumulative uh, growth rate of over 20%. Very few exchanges can kind of uh, boast of that. And uh, the second part is that's how we have a stock price that allows us to kind of even make a bid for a larger exchange like ASX, which is part of the problem, you know, where people think it's a smaller exchange that's making a bid for a larger exchange. But, but I think it's all about our potential and how we are viewed by the investing public. You have a lot of infrastructure put in place. Um, and as you just pointed out, um, you know, you've got a, a very comprehensive derivatives trading platform. But they're not necessarily used by the traders. The CME traders do not necessarily use Singapore as a one-stop um, um, shopping spot for the rest of Asia. Uh, no, I wouldn't say that. I would say that it, the... The, the traders who are not very large institutions and who are futures traders in the U.S. use SGX extensively. So if you look at the volume of Nikkei that is traded on SGX versus the home market, if you look at the contract in Taiwan traded, in, in each of those contracts, about 20 to 25 percent of the volume is on SGX and the 75 percent is in the home market. And by having that interplay between an overseas location and the home market, it also helps kind of ensure continuity regardless of what happens, you know, an earthquake in Taiwan or a tsunami in, to you know, in uh, Japan. In each of those kind of contexts, all of these dealers have always had access to an overseas location, similarly in the context of some of the issues in India. And, and we believe that a, you know, market share of about 25 to 30 percent is, is kind of appropriate for a second location. We don't think that 
we would be 100% of the, of the contract. So, so for us, the key from where we are is uh, one, expanding participation so that we bring more liquidity into each of those contracts and it helps the home market as well. And the second is to kind of expand our contracts such that we cover the rest of the market. So that's where we you know, constantly are in dialogue with Korea, we're constantly in dialogue with the marketplaces whose contracts we don't have on our platform.